Um, without further ado, I shall hand it straight over to um, David Graeber, who for many of you doesn't need an introduction, um, but his background is currently uh, teaches at the London School of Economics, been active in many of the anti-authoritarian activist protests, including Direct Action Network in 2000, the Occupy Wall Street movement in 2011, and is the author of many books, such as Debt, The First 5,000 Years, Lost People, Direct Action, Fragments of an Anarchist Anthropology, and most recently, The Utopia of Rules. David, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Roj Bas. Um, <laughs> I, I've been asked to talk about bureaucracy and class and dangers threatening the revolution in Rojava. And I think this is very, very important because I think this is probably the most important thing if we're just talking about beacons of historical hope, that the revolution in Rojava is probably the most important thing that's happened on this planet since Spain in the 1930s. This is a magnificent opportunity and it's and in fact, the revolution in Rojava has now lasted longer than the Spanish Revolution. It's managed to maintain itself. Um, and I, I think that um, as the embargo is lifted, certain problems are going to occur that have to be dealt with. And I think people are thinking about this, but I think um, it's really important for us to understand exactly what the danger that we're facing in the most insidious forms. Um, my own experience of the global justice movement and then Occupy Wall Street was marked by a gradual realization that both of these things were movements against bureaucracy, that capitalism itself has increasingly taken on more and more bureaucratic forms. Um, I guess we first began to realize this with the protests against what was then called globalization. Um, the anti, so-called anti-globalization movement, of course, was not an anti-globalization movement. It was a, we called ourselves the globalization movement. We saw ourselves as calling for a real effacement of borders and, and, and human solidarity against a system which was, you know, masked itself as globalization, but was actually creating stronger and stronger borders against the movement of people and ideas so as to allow capital to flow freely and exploit those borders. Um, but over time we realized that um, in fact what we were really dealing with is the first global administrative bureaucracy. That is to say there are all these institutions that most people in America at least, they didn't even really know they existed. Things like the WTO, the IMF, the World Bank, and that there was a sort of seamless web between them, transnational corporations, international finance, um, and including NGOs. Um, that essentially, for the first time in human history, there was a planetary administrative bureaucracy, um, which had, was completely lacking in democratic accountability. And what we were trying to do is expose the workings of that system. And that's why they had those giant um, festivals against capitalism every time the IMF met or the World Bank met. It was partly just to point to the existence of the people who are really administering the world. Um, and we tried to fight that by creating our own model of what genuine bottom-up democracy could be like. Um, when we fast forward 10 years to Occupy Wall Street, um, in fact, in a way, we it was kind of the same thing. And once again, we didn't really think of it that way um, when we first began the movement. But over time, it became increasingly clear that we were fighting something very, very similar. Um, the idea of the 1%. The 1% were the, both that group of people who had gained all the, basically had reaped all of the profits from economic growth. It all went to 1% of the population. But they were also the people who made all the political contributions. Something like 99% of the political contributions came from 1% of, of, of the population. Essentially, these people had bought the political system. Um, American political system in particular is just a system of institutionalized bribery. Uh, 
these people had managed to turn their wealth into power and their power back into wealth. Um, they were continually creating situations where um, they could use the government as an apparatus to extract wealth. So that capitalism itself was operating differently. Um, the profits from the major, major Wall Street corporations were less and less derived from commerce, let alone production, and more and more simply from finance. But what finance means is other people's debts. Uh, it, and debts had to be created through policy, very intentional policies. So essentially, you know, bu bureaucracy was being used as the mode of extracting capitalist surplus. So you have this global system which creates and maintains debt and other means of extracting resources. Um, and it's completely outside of any kind of democratic accountability. Um, it struck me that this is all very important when I um, visited Rojava two years ago because there are similar bureaucracies that are working um, and essentially what it rapidly became clear to me that there's a kind of a game that one plays in this region. Um, and this game is mediated by corporate bureaucracies, it's mediated by military bureaucracies, and it's also me mediated by humanitarian bureaucracies, which are part of that same web. Um, essentially, the game is that you create images of both terror and human suffering. So there's a sort of marketing of images, of, of scary images and, and heartbreaking images that are then circulated. Um, and you exploit them to con essentially get weapons, um, patronage, money, and control resources, mainly oil. Um, and so the entire thing was a series of, of, of top-down redistributive hierarchies. This is very, very clear if you go to Bashur um, in Iraq. And you know, the entire game, like, like Daesh was playing it, um, the various governments are playing it in different ways. They're all playing to the media. It's very clear, for example, that Daesh, these guys have seen a lot of Hollywood movies. You know. They were going off and trying to create the image of, of that Westerners have in their mind of what the most evil people possible was. But it was all part of a game of manipulation of images. Um, and what really struck me when I talked to people um, in the Kurdish movement, in the Kurdish freedom movement, was they were, you know, the basic question is how do we create a different game? How do we break out of these constraints? Um, I deeply remember a conversation with Nilifer Koj, was, uh, of the Casey King, who was talking about oil. And there's a lot of oil in Rojava. Um, at the moment, they can't export it because there's an embargo. And she was saying, well, you know, I mean, we could sell the oil, we could sort of get into the networks that everyone else is practicing, but I, maybe there's some way to do something else of oil. Could we just give it as a gift? And, and you know, that kind of creativity is trying to break out of the terms of the game was essentially what the revolution is all about. Um, and it allowed me to see what was happening in, in Rojava in a different way because oddly enough, there were a lot of people there who um, felt that, you know, in a way the blockade, while it's terrible in terms of humanitarian effects, um, oh, it's also a in certain ways an advantage. Um, so, in thinking about this, actually, um, I realized that, that, in a way, this is the, one of the greatest problems that revolutionary movements face, and um, allowed me to rethink my own experience and, and um, reevaluate it in this light, is essentially how to integrate with these larger bureaucratic institutions which are based on coercive force and, and are essentially the lifeblood, the sort of very fabric of capitalism at this point. Um, without, you know, you have to integrate them to get resources, um, but at the same time, you have to create structures which ensure that their logic doesn't capture you and take you over. And I realized that that's exactly what they were trying to do. In Rojava, you had essentially two structures of power. Um, you had the self-administration, which looks just like a government. Um, it's got a parliament, it's got ministers, it's got all the sort of formal apparatus of government. And then you have the bottom-up structures. Um, you have the various you know, structures of democratic confederalism <laughs> with three different layers of delegation from lower-level councils to higher. 
So at first, a lot of us, you know, when we looked at the Constitution, it just, you know, this doesn't look particularly um, anti-state. It looks just like a state. And a lot of people were very critical of it. But then when you got there, you realize there's, you know, there's two structures, and that top structure is essentially necessary to deal with outsiders. Um, at the same time, people would insist this is not a state project, and the reason why it was not a state project was because anybody with a gun, anybody who's actually got coercive force, is answerable to the bottom-up structures and not to the top-down ones. And this is, the key, I think, the key to the Roger Revolution. It's essentially a dual power situation, and this might be unique in history. It's a dual power situation where essentially the same people have set up both parts. And it came home to me, most of all, when I was in Kamislo. Uh, in Kamislo, there's, you know, one part was still controlled by the government. And there's a sort of street, there's the post office, which I think was their center. But principally, they controlled the airstrip. Um, I wondered about this for a while, and I realized, you know, that, that makes perfect sense, right? Because, um, you know, what are you going to do with an airport if you've only got one? You know, if there's two airports, you can fly back and forth between them, right? But if you've only got one airport, um, you know, all you, you can't fly anywhere because if you want to fly someplace, you have to, you know, sort of sign on to all these international agreements. Um, you have to have security agreements, you have to have safety agreements, you have to have commercial agreements of various kinds. But you can't actually do that unless you're a state. So it, it shows how these sort of bureaucratic mechanisms, which are, you know, on surface very benevolent and necessary, you don't want your airplane to crash, and people in Rojava have definite security concerns. If they were flying planes, people would try to blow them up. Um, so, so, you know, but nonetheless, you know, all those international agreements assume a certain form. They assume that you are a state, and they won't deal with you unless you do so. So um, and you basically have have to create a membrane, some sort of structure between the, uh, all the organizational forms that can integrate with international institutions, which will impose a state form on you, and the sort of bottom-up directly democratic experiment, which is the very lifeblood of what makes Rojava so brilliant and historically hopeful. Um, and most of the quarrels that I saw, and when I looked for points of tension, what were people arguing about, it always had to do with that. Um, I'll just mention two that very much struck me at the time. Um, one was when we went to um, talk to the sort of, I don't think it was economic minister, I can't remember what the technical title was, the people who were sort of coordinating economic affairs. And they were talking about the terrible effects of the embargo, the need to get it, access to technology, the desire to create various relationships um, internationally. and. Oh, they all made perfect sense. They said that we're in a very desperate economic situation. But afterwards, Nazan, who was one person who was with our delegation who'd been there um, a year earlier and talked to similar people, said, wow, that's a completely different line than what we heard last time. Um, because last time we were here, the people were saying, you know, in a way, the embargo is a blessing in disguise because it allows us to create autonomous institutions to become self-sufficient. Um, and realize that, you know, this is a point of tension. There are people who, and these are very well-educated, sophisticated people who'd been around the world, you know, sort of saw Rojava as inside a network of social relations of different types of um, economic, political, um, and social relations with the outside world, which uh, they, they made a case. There's things that were desperately needed. The infrastructure was going to fall apart unless they got replacement parts for certain things. Um, but at the same time, there are other groups who are saying, well, you know, that's a reasonable price to pay for the, having the freedom to create an autonomous experiment. Um, the second point where I saw people really arguing about something was during one of the assemblies we went to. And you could tell these assemblies were the real thing because often people got very angry and started shouting at each other. So, you know, clearly this wasn't staged democracy. This was the real thing. Um, well, the thing which people got most excited about um, was about the Asayish, the you know, roughly translated police, the sort of internal security. Um, and there was one case where they had to call them in. I can't remember what the problem was. I think it was somebody who was thought to be hoarding sugar. Um, but they, they wanted to bring in some people to look in someone's house. 
And the um, person who showed up, this is the local um, security uh, committee of the local uh, directly democratic assembly. Um, and, and they said that, you know, when a member of the OSCE showed up, the first thing he said was, well, okay, I can't do that unless I check with my commanding officer for authorization. And they became very upset, right? Um, they said, what? No, what are you talking about? That's like top-down hierarchy, you know? Uh, you're answerable to us. We're the local group, you know? Um, and, you know, they were debating, well, what do we do? Maybe we should, like, make up a hat or something or a badge. Maybe that'll impress them um, to remind these guys that we're actually the actual authority they're supposed to be answering to. Um, so there's already a deep awareness of the danger that a sort of top-down logic and something like a state would happen unless you were constantly vigilant about letting that making sure that doesn't occur. Um, and I thought that was extremely important because it shows what's really at stake here. You know, you have intense pressure from above to integrate into larger systems, which, you know, you have to have international relations. But at the same time, they're going to constantly encourage a certain logic, which is going to assume that things go top down rather than bottom up. Um, yeah, okay, I, I can do that. Um, <laughs> in fact, you know, one of, another thing, when I left, I was looking over um, human rights reports in, in Rojava, and I noticed that Human Rights Watch wrote a fairly critical um, report, but one of the things they complained about was, they said people aren't given access to, you know, world stand, they, they don't meet the world standards of trials. I thought that was very telling, because, you know, in fact, they are trying to create a radically different bottom-up type of justice system, which is based on consensus principles, um, restorative justice, eliminating the notion of revenge and retribution, um, but which is all very beautiful, and it's an incredibly important historical <laughs> experiment, but again, from world standards, that's a human rights abuse, because you know, um, what human rights people are doing is trying to create safeguards against state power, but those safeguards against state power assume the existence of state power. So not having state power at all from their point of view is just as much a human rights abuse as, as um, you know, untrammeled direct state power. Um, so I think it shows, as in the case of the economic ministers, that it's extremely well-meaning people can be complicit in allowing a state logic to re-enter um, and, and endanger the entire project. Um, so I wanted, so at the end they asked us, uh, you know, okay, you've been seeing that we were there for 10 days, not very long. At the end they said to us, well, you know, offer us some criticisms. Um, you know, tell me, what, what can we do better? What should we watch out for? And, uh, you know, we kind of conferred on this and we came up with a list um, of the danger of the emergence of politicians. When you have a system of delegates, it's very time consuming. Not everyone can do it. So how do you guarantee that you know, certain people don't become basically political specialists and emerge as a political class? That was one question. Um, another one, you know, okay. Another one, you know, it was directly that. How do you create a membrane between the bottom-up structures and the top-down structures to ensure that this kind of very well-meaning but very dangerous, creeping um, bureaucratization doesn't enter in? And finally, um, the question of social class. Now, when people we talk to at Rojava, you know, when you mention class, a lot of the reaction was like, Oh no, you know, not that again. I don't really want to have another argument about whether peasants are actually, you know, proletarians or, you know, the sort of old Marxist debates um, are very tired and irrelevant. And I agree on that. But if you drop the question of social class entirely, I, I think that's equally dangerous. Um, because, you know, what you have if you take, say, the approach of someone like Pierre Bourdieu, there's different forms of capital. There's economic capital, and you can very much monitor that. But there's also social and cultural capital. There are certain people who are, you know, know have con international connections and also know how to deal with certain types of situations and people, sort of naturally, who will, for the best of reasons, end up recreating hierarchies um, through their relations with the outside world. And I think that, you know, one of the most important things is to figure out how to prevent that from happening. We had exactly the same problem in both 
the movements I was talking about, both in the global justice movement and in Occupy Wall Street. There was a tendency for internal bureaucratization. We, um, you know, people started treating processes and principles as if they were rules and you had to go by the rule book. And the more that happened, we noticed the more people of relatively upper middle class professional backgrounds started feeling much more comfortable and people of less elite backgrounds much more uncomfortable and kind of leaving the meetings. Um, and this is a constant danger in any social, um, social movement unless you're very deeply um, self-conscious about it. Um, but so paradoxically, I think in, in Rojava, um, you know, the embargo has allowed um, a new type of society to emerge, but the real challenges, I think, are going to be faced as things open up, uh, and, and they have to figure out a way to maintain the sort of beautiful bottom-up uh, energy without the creeping bureaucracy taking over. So I just wanted to throw that out as a problem, but I think it's very important to think about. <laughs> 